Well, thanks for the opportunity. Um, thank you for sharing this time on your schedule. And uh, what I hope to do today, I was kind of thinking uh, about way back when I was a little older as a college student when I went through, um, but just to try to promote forage agriculture in maybe a bigger sense than we frequently look at it. Um, and to give you a little bit of my background, um, I am trained in forage agronomy, ruminant nutrition. So this idea of healthy soils and healthy plants are things that I was trained in as well as nutrition for livestock and, and therefore health in animals obviously starts with proper nutrition. Um, about 10 years ago, a little bit more, I became very, very interested in the topic of human health. And I've since become an advocate for what I'm calling grass-based health, which is my way of talking about ruminant animal agriculture. Um, not grass-fed, grass-based, because we should understand that something like 94% of the feed that goes into supporting the global ruminant herd is not edible by humans. So it's plant matter, which you could broadly call grass. Um, and just as a fuller introduction, I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and ruminant animal agriculture. I've worked in forage agriculture for most of my adult life, and I presently work for a forage seed company, Barron Brogue USA, although I shouldn't be considered as a representative of that company here today. Um, and hopefully as a result of going through this forages class, you understand that the taste test is not part of a hay judging contest. Uh, many of the audiences that I get to speak in front of are filled with uh, physicians and human health researchers, nutritionists, they don't understand that. Um, so it's an opportunity to kind of broaden their horizons. And again, I have a point of view. There's no such thing as a point of view that's nobody's point of view. So um, you need to understand where I'm coming from, just like we need to understand every time somebody's coming at us, uh, where they're coming from. Doesn't make it wrong, but it's important to uh, get a sense of how to evaluate. So I've introduced myself to you. And as I said before, at the very beginning, I'm thinking about people who are not even yet entering into their professional career. So 2050, um, is within the professional lifespan of many people in this class. And so that's just 30 years from now. The world population is going to reach over 9 billion people per some estimates. Again, some estimates are saying we're going to need to double food production. And that's going to need to meet the increase in demand for animal source protein, some estimate two thirds, I will suggest that that's an underestimate of the need. There's lots of reasons for that. And obviously this food primarily has to come from the same land area as today. And we're aware of why that's probably not realistic, that we're losing our productive farmland. And so we could talk about that. Then there's some other things that I'm becoming aware of. For example, we're gonna to have to double electrical generating capacity globally to meet the needs of the 2050 world. How are we going to do that? How does that align with many of the conversations that take place today? Um, for some, something like three, over 3 billion people in the world today consume less electrical power per year than the average American refrigerator. Um, 
the number of people in India that have no access to electricity is greater than the entire population of the United States. So let's be sure that we've got a better view of the world and what we can be doing to foster human flourishing globally. Um, this is all going to be happening that by 2050, it's estimated 70% of humanity will live in urban areas. So this shift from rural subsistence agriculture into rural areas that's happened in the United States, 80 some percent of our population now lives in urban areas. And of course, that creates this dramatic separation between <clears throat> producers and consumers and leads to a lot of misunderstandings. This was one graphic that just made me shake my head that this idea that more, more of humanity lives within that circle than lives outside of it. And when you look at that circle, what would you estimate? Maybe less than half of that is land um, the rest, there's a lot of ocean in that circle and, and others have slightly adjusted that circle, but this just makes the point of where the population is and where is their food going to come from as we go forward. <clears throat> and contrary to many arguments that we can hear, it's simply the case that ruminant animal agriculture is essential to our food systems globally today, let alone the world of 2050. But in order to meet the needs of 2050, we're going to have to improve efficiency and productivity of ruminant animal agriculture globally. And you may or may not recognize this gentleman, uh, Dr. Borlaug is credited as being the father of the Green Revolution. Um, he's said to be the man that saved a billion people from starvation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, I make the case that we today need a ruminant revolution. And this is a global opportunity for people to work to improve the livelihoods and, and circumstances of our brothers and sisters globally. Again, I understand that there are other narratives and there's lots of information available to help us refute those narratives. Um, and that's part of what I hope to introduce today. Again, I mentioned earlier this idea of this divide between producers and consumers. Part of my role is that I get to stand between these various audiences or tribes that I've been introduced to uh, over the last decade plus. And, and I try to build bridges. Um, and this is one quote that I think sums it up that consumers and producers alike care about animal welfare, no, not rights, environmental stewardship, food safety, nutrition, and taste. We may have different perspectives on that, and it would be really, really good, I think, if we could foster greater conversations between these audiences. And it might help us in the long run um, us being primarily producers, us being members of the forage agriculture community, as we try to make the case for greater awareness, greater support, greater uh, resources to do the work that needs to be done to achieve that ruminant revolution that I just talked about. So here's one, the notion that raising livestock and consuming animal source food is fundamentally incompatible with sustainable development is flawed. This is from a researcher based at the University of Florida. He comes from Nigeria. So this is a paper that I recommend that everyone read. And when you look at the PDF that's been posted, all of these citations are there and there's a list of references in the last few slides so that you can find them and find them on Google Scholar. This, this PDF is available as a free access. And so some of these arguments that people 
come against us with look really different when you go to other parts of the world, that they're just not even on people's radar screen. Um, and, and that I think will help us too, if we can get people who are concerned about sustainability or they're concerned about the environment, they're concerned about animal welfare, let's just give them more information because right now, unfortunately, much of the information they have is coming from those who think that we don't need animal agriculture, let alone ruminant animal agriculture. So by this time, I'm sure that pasture management and uh, agronomy and uh, conserve forage production, whether it's hay or silage, forage crop production, all of those have been things that you've gotten a chance to learn about and they're tremendously important and I'm not minimizing them. It's what I was trained in. But again, that's only one aspect of forage agriculture. We need to promote the role of forage agriculture in conservation, whether that's wildlife habitat or uh, whether that's soil conservation. And this quote that when our soils are gone, we too must go unless we find some way to feed on raw rock. And this was over a hundred years ago, this man made this, this quote. So these problems have been with us for a while. And many people believe that modern agriculture is the problem. When in fact, modern agriculture in North America has gone a long way to reducing these problems. Now, they're still there, we still need to work on it. But we, we need to understand what the southeastern US looked like prior to the introduction of Kentucky 31 tall fescue, which in large part helped stabilize these soils that were in the process of washing out because of cotton and tobacco and other cropping systems. So one key aspect of forage agriculture is just the conservations of soil. We have these modern systems of contour farming, etc. cetera. Um, and, and many people don't appreciate this. And many people really aren't aware of just how much of our food supply comes from terrestrial as opposed to aquatic systems. And how little of the earth's surface is suitable for producing food that we can eat directly. So we have people who will talk about, well, we, we should just stop livestock agriculture as if we could convert all that land into crop production. And of course we can't. Um, this, this final bullet here of this 20% of global cultivated land was lost from agriculture in the past 40 years. So as we look toward 2050 and they're saying, we've got to produce all this food from the same amount of land, it's like, we probably aren't going to have the same amount of land in 2050. Um, but again, this is just information for us to internalize and then move forward with. Um, we, we have this, this question of soil health, which forgive me as a forage agronomist, I just think is the reintroduction of short rotation forage crops into cropping systems, call it whatever you want to. But this acknowledgement that we need to have plants protecting the soil growing. Um, and now many people are aware of this without being aware of the work that was done for the past 40 plus years. This is an example. Um, there's another example, but this will do. If you can imagine taking a 30 second of that apple and, and, and peeling that, that peel represents the soil that we depend on for those crops. And we just need to accept that when we cultivate soil, we necessarily harm soil health. Now, if you do that every five to 10 years, that's gonna look very different than if you do that every year. Um, but 
perennial grass crops improve soil health. So as people are talking about these things, this is something else for us to keep in mind. But more and more, we have people looking at integrating cropping systems where to varying lengths of time, we bring animals back into the cropping systems. In North America, we've had this period of specialization where cropping systems and livestock systems have gotten separated. In other parts of the world, they're looking at how to do that integration. Um, and we also have that work taking place in the United States. We need to point out though, that this argument about, it isn't either or, there isn't livestock farming or cropping farming. They're integrated, maybe not on the same farm, but a lot of, I think it was when you produce a hundred pounds of human edible plant source food, you're producing about 37 pounds of byproduct feed that has to go somewhere. And in the United States, it goes to livestock feed. Um, in the Pacific Northwest where I live, we have livestock grazing seed fields during period every year to manage the canopy to promote seed production. Um, in parts of the Great Plains, we have livestock grazing wheat fields as wheat pasture and then making a decision whether they're going to graze it out or they're going to go ahead and harvest a seed crop. So we have those integrations that look a little different depending on where you are in the world. But it's there and, and now we have more people looking as part of these systems of incorporating trees, silvo pasture or, uh, pasture or agroforestry systems. And so when I visited Brazil two years ago, um, they were doing systems where you had cropping with trees and livestock all together on operations. And of course their trees are ready to harvest in 20 years. <laughs> um, it looks a little different. Um, but again, these ideas that they're now arguing that they can produce what they were calling zero carbon beef, which of course isn't, but we could talk about that. So this idea of, of keys to healthy soil, cover the soil. Does this sound like forage agriculture? High plant diversity. Does this sound like pasture systems? Minimize soil mechanical disturbance. Does this sound like perennial forage systems? Grow plants for maximum days each year. Again, uh, incorporate well-managed ruminants. Just throwing ruminants onto the field isn't enough. We have to manage them. Uh, manage livestock to enhance soil function. All of these aspects are essential components of what I would argue are forage-based ruminant animal systems. And so we can make the case that we can have healthy soil and healthy people thanks to ruminants. Yes, the greatest wealth is health, but we got a lot of people who have been told that these products of ruminant animal agriculture are somehow a threat to health. Well, not so fast. We can justifiably make the case that true health food comes from ruminants. Now, as a result of taking this forages class and other animal sciences classes, you can understand the joke when I say that these are fermented plant products. Not everybody can, so that gives us an opportunity to explain that to people so that they can understand. I gave one presentation when I got done, a very muscular man came running down the center aisle toward the microphone and I was concerned that he stopped at the microphone because he's a very large man. And he had several questions he wanted to ask, not uh, which started with, so you're telling me that beef animals don't sp spend their entire life in a cage, not, not even a pen, a cage, um, and, and that they don't just eat corn. 
Um, so we need to find better ways to tell our story, which I suggest when we do, people will realize just what a great story we have to tell. And people don't understand the difference between simple stomached animals and ruminants and the, the tremendous importance of that difference. And one key difference right here to point out, and it's not even within agriculture is, is always appreciated. And that is that ruminant animals are, are carbohydrate based animals while we and other simple stomached animals are carbohydrate, uh, are, are fat based. That if you feed too much fat to a ruminant animal, bad things happen. And we're talking more than 5% crude fat. Um, and yet we have volatile fatty acids as a primary source of energy for the ruminant. So the ruminant animal will eat a diet that's 5% or less crude fat. By the time we have the, the microbial fermentation take place, maybe 70 to 80% of her energy comes from the volatile fatty acids that she absorbed. So this is a key ecological function that these animals fit. And then we need to understand the difference between plant source protein and animal source protein, plant source fat versus animal source fat, all the nutrients that come from plant sources versus animal sources. Another quote from a relatively recent paper, um, livestock source foods are important if the global nutritional, educational, and economic needs are to be met and can be used to feed developing countries out of poverty. I love that phrase, um, feed developing countries out of poverty. We don't usually look at it that way. So ruminants are essential to sustainability. This idea that they upcycle nutrients, that they can take this plant source protein, which is really low value protein and if, if it's of any value to us at all and create the highest value protein sources for human nutrition. They're a significant source of income for a significant number of people in the world. They're a significant source of fertilizer, something like 60% of the fertilizer necessary to produce the crops comes from livestock manure. And obviously a significant portion of that is going to come from ruminant animals. Half, over half of the world's farmers still depend on draft animals. And obviously those are uh, to a large part ruminant animals. Ecosystem services, maintenance of grassland health, reducing burden, uh, uh, you know, fuel burden, uh, wildlife benefits, watershed health, all of these things. And unfortunately, we live in a world where a billion people in the world are still dependent on burning dirty biomass fuels to cook on. And that includes dung. When you burn dung, you lose the fertility, you create indoor air pollution, which kills millions of people a year due to respiratory disease. Um, but it's a reality. So let's talk about the big picture as we're looking at for ways to improve, um, increase human flourishing. Because cattle rely on grazing and forages, they need only six tenths of a kilogram or a pound of protein from human edible feed to produce a kilogram or a pound in this case of protein in meat, milk and meat, and that's of higher nutritional quality than the plant proteins that were consumed. The upcycling is an essential function. So when people talk about eliminating livestock, um, what's their alternative? How are you going to replace? Because it's not a one-to-one -one swap. You're going to have to replace far more pounds of, of plant source food to replace the pound of animal source food. 
I've talked about their essential roles. They convert structural and non-structural carbohydrates into fat. They convert plant protein, put that in quotes, we'll get to that real soon, um, and non-protein nitrogen into highest quality animal protein. They reduce the unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids from plants to monounsaturated and stable saturated fatty acids through a process called biohydrogenation. They produce vitamin B12 and other vitamins that in some cases are not provided by plants or in others are not as bioavailable from plants. They increase the bioavailability of essential minerals. Iron from plants is in no way as available as heme iron from animal source foods. They degrade anti-quality plant components. So there are a number of components that come in plant source foods that interfere with mineral or uh, other aspects of, of digestibility. In some cases, they have demonstrable harm to the human digestive system. They maintain the health of grassland ecosystems. They recycle nutrients and build soil health. They provide services and byproducts, and they generate new wealth. So if somebody is going to advocate for the elimination of, of livestock in general or ruminant animal livestock in specifics, what's their adequate substitute? And they don't have one. Uh, but I can hear people say, um, and it's right to ask, what do you know? You're just a forage agronomist. Well, of course, we would argue that just is completely inappropriate. I mean, we're forage agronomists after all, but it's a fair question. So I can't tell you the number of times that I've gotten to tell people that crude protein is not true protein. Now, anyone taking a Animal, ag, uh, animal nutrition class would know this. I'm standing in front of groups of physicians and human nutritionists that don't know that when it says protein on the label for some processed food product, that's not true protein. It's crude protein, we understand the limitations. Um, so I don't need to spend a lot of time on this, um, but the difference between crude protein and true protein is always going to be greater in plant source foods than in animal source foods. And true protein from animal source foods contains a higher proportion of what we've called nutritionally essential amino acids than plant source foods. There's a little now controversy about that phrase nutritionally essential because even the quote non-essential, if you could somehow create an artificial diet that was devoid of even these non-essential amino acids, just because we can make some, there is no evidence in the literature that we could make enough. So all of that now is kind of in flux. And unfortunately, human protein nutrition has kind of taken a backseat to this whole nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease and hasn't gotten the resources it needs. And we could talk about that. But again, you look at global protein supply figures and you need to understand that that's crude protein and then look at it on a global basis and realize humanity is currently getting more of its protein supply from cereals than from animal source foods. And I am here to say that that's a problem for a number of reasons. Um, you can go to poor parts of the world. So the tropical population, the poorest 20% gets more protein from rice than they get from beans, meat, and milk. Now, I would throw beans out of that, but that's the quote. Um, I spoke to one researcher recently, and they said that if you're trying to get your protein from lentils and rice, an eight-year-old boy 
could not eat enough if he had free choice of a beans and lentil diet to get what he needs for his essential amino acid nutrition. And we, again, we, we, we had, we have various conversations going on, but it's just the science has moved past and unfortunately hasn't informed a lot of these conversations. Don't for a moment think that this is not a problem that's only confined to the low and middle income countries of the world. This is NHANES data. This is the United States. This is 2015 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. Over 40% of Americans don't get enough protein in their diet. And most females over the age of eight don't get enough protein. And what's remarkable here to me is that it's worse than this. It's worse than this because they're counting animal source food protein and plant source food protein as if they're equivalent. And they're utilizing an RDA, recommended daily allowance, as the target when in fact it's the minimum. So it, it's worse than this, but then what's remarkable is the authors went on to say that based on this data, they did not consider protein a nutrient of concern. No idea how you get there, but they did. And part of it has got to do with a number of factors that we could get into. I'm just laying out the information. You should know in forages, that plant source foods are far more variable in their nutrient content than are animal source foods. So here's just one example in soybeans, which is sort of the gold standard of plant source protein, right? Um, I went to this cropcomposition.org database, almost 6,000 samples of soybeans, grain are in there, and the crude protein can vary plus or minus 20% around a mean of 39. We know we test hay lots and silage lots because it varies for a number of reasons. Most people don't know this, that when you calculate your values for a recipe or for a food label that is based on these average table values. Or maybe you did one run where you got a value, but then you don't do it for every run of whatever product it is that you're making because you can't print new labels on every container or every label that you, it just doesn't happen that way. The individual amino acids can vary plus or minus 45% around their mean values. So we're telling people, you know, that they need to pay attention to this if they're going to go on these diets where they limit animal source food consumption, but they don't have the information they need to do the job. And I'm not even going to get into calories, which is a whole nother thing. Wheat is I showed that more of humanity's protein supply comes from cereals than all animal source food. Wheat is the number one source, more than any animal, single animal source food. It's 20% it's of humanity's protein comes from wheat. And again, you can have tremendous variation in, in the crude protein value of wheat at 9 to 15% crude protein. We have different market classes of wheat, and then any one of those could vary based on any number of practices or environmental effects. Again, we don't, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure people aren't aware of this when they go and, and they're also not aware of this. It's a poor quality um, protein source. And so there's, there's a, a value of protein quality estimation for human nutrition now called DIAS, Digestible Indispensable Amino Acid Score um, for over seven years now. Um, it's been defined as what we should be moving toward. Um, but basically, as we age, we get marginally better at utilizing the protein um, that's of, and the individual indispensable amino acids that's, that are in wheat. Um, understand that virtually all animal source foods are going to be over 100 on this score. 
So as you look at a 37 or a 45 or a 54, keep that in mind. But when we process wheat, because we don't just, you know, chew on raw wheat berries primarily, we're consuming it as breakfast cereals or, or you know, wheat, uh, bread or some other um, food, we decrease the digestible, in, indispensable amino acid score dramatically. So you may have heard of browning reaction in forages. Uh, same thing here, except we call it a crust or we call it, you know, crispy wheat cereal or whatever. It's, it's the irreversible bonding of lysine with carbohydrate, and then we can't digest that lysine. A lot of people don't know that. It doesn't happen with animal source food when we process them. So please just let people know that a processed plant product is in no way similar to a processed animal product, right? That in some cases, we actually increase the digestibility of those indispensable amino acids. So we take raw pork belly at all 119, we make bacon out of it and it's 142. God, that's wonderful. <laughs> Let's do that more. Um, and you can see the other products that are that are shown here. And again, not a lot of people know this, but you do now. So how do we then start thinking about um, we're going to produce animal source foods, we're going to have products, but we need shelf stable products. We need products that are ready for consumption when they get to somebody who may not have reliable refrigeration or any of these things. Well, we've been told to kind of consider those things as if they're second class foods. Uh, one wonderful story that someone told me from their own personal experience, um, their mother um, was visiting, she's raising three teenage boys, she's not going to go to the store and buy, you know, grass fed beef for them, she, she can't afford it. Uh, they like spam. Um, her mother is visiting and she's cooking spam for her three teenage boys and she apologizes to her mother because of this. And her mother says, oh no, I, I love spam. And, and it's like, what? Oh yeah, no, it turns out her mother was a 15 year old girl in Berlin during the airlift. Now, think about that and all that went on immediately prior to that and after. But in this case, one of the things that was airlifted in was spam. Here's her line, spam tastes like freedom. <laughs> I told her she needed to contact Hormel immediately <laughs> and give them that. Um, but we in agriculture and in animal science, in animal nutrition and in veterinary medicine are almost trained to, to feel like we're somehow second class to animal nutri or human nutrition and, and medicine. And, and what we need to understand is that the quality of the research that we can perform is superior to what the human nutrition and medicine community can perform. There are ethical restraints on what they can do, and that's a good thing. And, and so we need to just be a little bit more um, aware of those differences, not in, you know, like, a, a, an attacking way, but just to make ourselves more secure in what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm telling people that consulting nutritionists and veterinarians get fired every single day. Whereas in human nutrition and human health, their primary default mode is to say, well, you're just not following my advice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable. And yet it is with humans and it's not. So uh, 
again, for almost four decades, swine nutritionists have been balancing rations on an essential amino acid content basis. And we have yet to get anywhere near there on human nutrition. But we have a lot of environmental conversations that ignore that critical aspect of just, for example, protein nutrition, that when we can consider the essential amino acid content and availability basis of the foods that are produced, these differences minimize. And so we, we need to incorporate that into these models and conversations about the environmental footprint. For example, this is a list of plant source foods that many people would consider to be good protein sources. But even based on the PD-CAS, which is the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score System, which DIAS is replacing, uh, almonds, sunflower seeds, and peanut butter do not qualify as a good protein source. And when we go to dias, only chickpeas will. And that's just for good. Remember, all, all, virtually all animal source foods are going to be considered excellent sources of protein on the dias score. So again, just more information for people. Hopefully they can use it. Um, animal source foods are superior to plant source foods as sources of the amino acids and other essential nutrients humans require for proper development and health. In fact, something like a quarter of children globally under five are stunted due to a lack of animal source food in their diet. Two billion people suffer from micronutrient malnutrition. Earlier I said that Professor Borlaug saved a billion people from starvation. We have something like three billion people in the world today that suffer from some form of malnutrition. We have 800 million that are calorically malnourished, frankly don't get enough energy, but we got 2.2 billion that are overweight or obese which we need to understand is a form of malnutrition. And there's more that we could talk about there. This issue of Animal Frontiers, October last year, foods of animal origin, pres um, a prescription for global health. Recommend that people read this. Again, links in the references. Um, lots and lots and lots of evidence of a lack of animal source food in the human diet. And again, this is not just a phenomenon in the low and middle income countries. This is a phenomenon as well in the high income countries. I ask the question when it comes to the consumption of animal source foods, there is such a thing as too little. It's factual, it's objective, it's, it's, it's just there throughout the literature. I want to ask the question, is there really such a thing as too much? Now, people believe there is, people have said so. And in fact, when you read Animal Frontiers, you will read many of these people who are, they're doing this research, demonstrating too little, but then they feel like they have to say something about too much as if animal source food is what produces obesity or raises the risk of chronic disease not so fast. There's a number of recent papers for people to look at that just says, you know, claims that red meat causes chronic disease are weak. You know, here's one paper. There's a series of papers that came out toward, you know, later part of last year. Um, they don't meet causality criteria. So many of these are based on observational data. And they're saying, okay, we, we, we see these people getting this and then we, we, we've tried to estimate what they eat and now we're going to make the, they don't even 
when they do that, they don't follow the rules. There's obvious bias at work here. And, and they're just frankly contrary to common sense. Claims that the health dangers of red meat are not only improbable in the light of our evolutionary history, they are far from being supported by robust scientific evidence. Now, <clears throat> frankly, they're often dishonest. And here was um, a, a paper or an art, uh, editorial that was talking about, there was a series of papers that came out in Annals of Internal Medicine. Um, the people involved did a really good job of ensuring that they were transparent, that they didn't have conflict of interest that didn't stop people from accusing them of that. Um, some of the researchers have built their careers on nutritional epidemiology. I can understand it's upsetting when the limitations of your work are uncovered and discussed in the open. Vegan advocate Dr. David Katz compared the articles, which he called a great debacle of public health, to information terrorism that can blow to smithereens the life's work of innumerable careful scientists. Well, um, don't doubt that it could bring about that result. I would argue about his description of that event and the scientists involved. We've had a tremendous amount of belief and worldview involved in this subject of human nutrition and human nutrition policy over the years. It's a big story. Uh, get to some good sources for people to check, but it's, it's time to recognize that not all the information that we've been receiving has been as well sourced as people would confidently assert. And yes, I did just mention the V word there. Um, I'm trying to avoid um, the diet wars. Look, as far as I'm concerned, there are three viable human diets. You can be a carnivore, you can be a vegan, or you can be an omnivore. Those are your three options. And People who want to hide in the vegetarianism, for some reason, they don't feel comfortable saying that I'm eating animal source foods, right? I mean, even when we look at places like India, they're eating animal source foods. You can call them vegetarians, but they're eating dairy products or they're eating fish or they're eating poultry. Uh, in some parts, they're actually eating lamb or goat. It's beef that they don't eat. Um, in the United States, you have various ovo, lacto, pisco, pollo, whatever, um, vegetarians, and that's all fine. I'm all for you. Um, but I think we need to get a little clearer with our language so people don't get confused. Um, whatever dietary approach people choose, I would like to ask if we couldn't just agree that we ought to be focusing on achieving adequate essential nutrition and attaining and may or restoring, well, put it, maintaining or restoring metabolic health. Now, those are two broad categories. We need to have a fuller conversation about both of them, but please understand that today in the United States, about 12% of adult Americans enjoy optimal metabolic health. 12, one, two. Um, the rest are in some form of metabolic derangement. Please understand that the biggest killers today globally are not the infectious diseases. They are the non-communicable diseases, which are primarily metabolic. Um, please understand that even in the midst of this pandemic, that these metabolic issues are often talked about as comorbidities, right? So uh, there's, there's an interaction between our infectious and non-infectious diseases. And so proper nutrition is critical even when we're talking about infectious disease, which we understand in animal husbandry because we know that we shouldn't be using antibiotics to get ourselves out of poor nutrition, right? Um, 
And then once we understand those things, then people should choose accordingly based on their personal preferences, their personal situation, their personal responses. For example, right now, most people should be looking, especially adults, should be looking at their fasting insulin levels, not their fasting glucose levels. Um, they should not be paying attention to their total cholesterol or their LDL cholesterol. Again, I'm not that kind of doctor, so don't take anything I say as medical advice, but I'm happy to help you find information so that you can be truly informed when you speak to your medical uh, professional. I'll stand on this statement. The preponderance of and high quality evidence from all scientific disciplines strongly suggests that the most likely harm associated with meat consumption is from not consuming enough. That's globally. Now, how might that shift our conversation if we could get more people to understand that? There's a growing body of people who understand this who are not in agriculture. How can we get those people together? We talk about sustainability, make sure that we're talking about the three phases or factors of sustainability in whatever system you're talking about. There's got to be a societal component. There's got to be an economic component as well as an ecological component. So when we look at all those, the case for livestock agriculture, ruminant animal agriculture in particular, as well as um, the, the, the value of the products of those systems for human health and well-being is just very, very compelling and very clear. What if the non-communicable disease burden could be dramatically reduced through the consumption of more animal source foods? Well, how one of the ways to look at this is what's the impact, what's the footprint of healthcare? And a series of papers, um, because we don't look at this yet in our models and our conversations. Our analysis shows that the pharmaceutical industry is significantly more emissions intensive than the automotive industry. The healthcare system alone in the United States produces 10% of greenhouse gas emissions by this estimate, as well as other pollution. So sometimes I just can't resist the snark and I just wanna say, you know, both professions wear white coats, which produces more greenhouse gases. Well, the beef industry alone is 2%, right? All of livestock agriculture is 4%. All of agriculture is 9%. U.S. healthcare is 10%. We're not used to looking at things this way. We need to. We need to find people who are working in this area so we can have these conversations. In the U.K. alone, those people who are served by National Health Service, 5% of all road traffic is caused by the National Health Service. So we could have these impacts that ought to be on the positive plus side, and they're currently not. We only look at the negative side. And of course, we need to talk about the difference between uh, a, 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 stock, a flow versus a stock emission that, that in uh, livestock and ruminant animal agriculture, we're cycling CO2. Even the methane that's produced is, is oxidized back to CO2 within 10 years. Um, but, uh, if the average U.S. person uh, with type 2 diabetes um, so we can look at their, their pharmaceutical consumption, we, we, if the average type 2 diabetic in America could eliminate their medication use, they reduce their carbon footprint 29% more than if they went from a meat heavy to a vegan diet. Now, nobody stays on a vegan diet. So, um, but here we have this aspect, Verda Health has now published three-year data showing that they've been able to get drug-free remission in type two diabetics. 
for 60% of the, the patients that came on. And this, I think, was at two years when this data was shown. So reduced medication use, reduced insulin use. Um, we can do that. And a lot of people don't know that drug-free remission of type 2 diabetes is in fact possible. Conversations taking place, people living in um, uh, rural areas, obviously healthcare access is a, is a big concern. So this is one of those aspects where I say everybody eats. So everybody's concerned about their health, the health of their family. If you're in family-based businesses, you're very concerned about the health of the generations involved, your workers, the cost of health care. So this is something, again, that cuts across a lot of these um, uh, tribes and boundaries. Um, some books to recommend, and I'm sorry that my uh, animation broke here. Uh, Gary Taubes is one of the authors that I started reading uh, 12 years ago, uh, stalking him ever since. Good Calories, Bad Calories was the, his first book on human health. Um, if you'd like a really geeky book that would be a good graduate level textbook for human nutrition and the history of it, that would be the book. Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It was the one that he was asked to write to be more uh, accessible. Uh, his latest book is The Case Against Sugar, which lets you see how one industry influenced the diet and health um, research and conversation against um, fat, for example. Um, he's got another book that's due out in two months' time. Um, the the Big Fat Surprise by Nina Teichholz. The subtitle is Why Butter, Meat, and Cheese Belong in a Healthy Diet. Um, the diet that I followed when I realized that I was a 51-year-old balding, obese, pre-diabetic uh, was this book, um, Protein Power Life Plan by Michael and Mary Dan Eads. Um, I can tell you that by eating a primarily animal source diet, uh, today I'm just balding. Um, dietdoctor.com is a web resource that I recommend anybody go to to check out. Um, they do have a, a subscription portion of their website. They don't take uh, advertising money. They don't accept money from industry. I do have some videos that are posted there, but I get no um, remuneration from that site. Um, but there's a lot of information that's outside their paywall and their subscription is like $7 a month or something. So, and the first month is free. You could can't you check it out. Um, this is a book that just came out this year, uh, Why We Get Sick, which Dr. Bickman acknowledges he's leveraging Gary Taubes' Why We Get Fat book. But this book looks at the tie between chronically elevated insulin and virtually all the chronic diseases that we can now name. So it, it, it's a very compelling book, very accessible, recommend it to everyone. Hans Rosling, uh, unfortunately, has passed away, but his son and daughter-in-law finished this book, Factfulness, and I recommend it for anyone who wants to get a more current view of what the world actually looks like, rather than what, you know, the 30 or 40 years ago version looks like. Robert Bryce has written a lot on this question of energy and power, um, and his latest book is called A Question of Power. He also has a documentary that's been released called Juice, How Electricity Explains the World, and recommend that for people to take a look at just to get a sense of Again, the things we take for granted, and today there are conversations about this that I would argue are not well-informed, and it's good for us to have a fuller perspective on the topic. So uh, I do say that a steak a day keeps the doctor away. <clears throat> Again, I'm not that kind of doctor, um, but imagine the effect that this could have on the beef industry if more of the consuming public had this sense in their mind. Uh, imagine the benefits 
uh, to the beef community itself. If we could get a better idea of what actually constitutes a healthy diet, as opposed to what we've been told is a healthy diet. And, and we could better inform our neighbors as well as our customers. So um, gone a little bit longer than I thought, but maybe not so bad. You can find me all over social media. These are accounts that you can find me on. Um, I have also a Facebook page which or group, which is called The Ruminati, um, which is my attempt to kind of have a space where people can come together from various aspects to understand this in a closed group kind of way. So it is moderated, but um, the, there are interesting conversations that pop up every once in a while, but um, you can find a lot of presentations that I've given on um, various venues on YouTube. And if you have any questions, uh, comments, I welcome your input um, at my email or any of the other ways that you can get in touch. And yes, there really is a town in Nova Scotia called Meat Cove. And of course, I had to go there. I was traveling by myself, so I made sure I took a tripod and set the camera up and took the picture. So I'm that guy.